Good morning, everybody. So I know you're all excited to see Mike back. You got one more week and he'll be back. Just bear with me just for a moment. I'll fill in this week and try to do my best. So. All right. Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. All right. It's working. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So how many of us remember back in Sunday school and singing about the wise man building his house in the rock? The foolish man built his house in the sand, and the end of the song goes, splat! And this foolish man's house falls down. How many of you remember that song? I see lots of hands. That was a fun song, wasn't it? So, as a little kid, the funnest part of that was the splat, right? That really did drive a home message for me that don't build your house on the beach, no matter how pretty it is. But, digging a little bit deeper, let's turn our Bibles to the verses where that song came from. And let's dig a little bit deeper than just not build your house on the beach. Let's turn to Matthew 7, 24, if you would. Let me see if this will work. There we go. So I have the verses up here, but if you want to turn your Bible, please do also. So in these verses, we have Jesus talking. And he's wrapping up the famous Sermon on the Mount. So basically, he's given the, the message of basically, here's a whole bunch of information. It's a very, very dense sermon. There's a lot of information there. And this is like the final part of it. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Notice that, and great was its fall. So, all right, with the explanation that fall is not a season of the year, how many want a great fall? Nobody, right? Nobody. It's a pretty easy, pretty easy choice to make. Now, however, once we make that choice for not falling, the question becomes, how exactly? What do you mean by that? So, all right. Last week was New Year's. How many stayed up to midnight? All right, so y'all got practice. Everybody's up to midnight. We got a big, hard, large topic here of life, instructions for it. Everybody ready for another long sermon? I see some laughs. No. <laughs> so, I imagine nobody here online wants that. So, how about this? How about... And no one wants to hear that. How about we try to do this in 30 minutes less? Life instructions left time, in less time than it takes to deliver a pizza. Think we can do it? Everybody knows me, I do short sermons. So probably like, yeah, he can probably do it. <laughs> Let's try. So, it's a challenge. Let's give it a shot. So, all right. If we're going to do this in less than 30 minutes, let's get to the core right away. Everybody who turned me to Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. And these are some famous verses. Matthew 22, get in verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord with your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So there you go. Love God with all you are. Love your neighbor. That's it. Okay. Done. Done. Ready? Now, before everybody goes, woohoo, and heads for the door, heads for lunch, a little bit more, right? Let's go a little bit further. So that really is the core of it all. Love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor yourself. That is the Bible wrapped up in a nutshell. But unless we understand it, we can't just follow the Nike slogan to just do it, right? It's not that easy. We want humans to want the bottom line. We also want more once we have the bottom line, don't we? 
We still want to finish this in 30 minutes less. So let's dig deeper. But let's keep it simple. And the good thing, God knows us humans, right? He can give us something that's incredibly dense and pack into a simple message. So let's go to our instruction manual of the Bible. And let's start back at the beginning. Turn back to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. The very first chapter of the Bible. So this is when God basically had just created everything. Man has just arrived on the scene and has his first instructions. And this is what he says. Genesis 1, 27 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. <laughs> then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, effectively, God's first instruction to us humans is get busy. I got some work for you to do. Get to work. So that's step one. We got stuff to do, right? But that's not fulfilling just yet, right? Let's go into what do we have to do. So, what is that work we've got to do? And so for that, I should know one of my favorite books, Ecclesiastes. And let's see how the wisest man, Solomon, actually boils things down. He gets down to the ethics of it really quickly. Turn to Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 13. So it says 20, but ignore that. That's a typo. It says 9 through 13. So Ecclesiastes 3, 9 through 13. And Solomon writes, What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task which is the sons of man are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in his time, and he also put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all of his labor. It is the gift of God. Now, Ecclesiastes is a really dense book. There's a whole lot packed in there. And there's a whole lot packed in that little space. But let's break this down a little bit. What exactly is Solomon writing about here? What is he saying? So notice the part that says everything beautiful in its time. But we have eternity in our hearts. So we're here on this earth, right? We're physical. We have our lives, what we find to do. And what we find to do in our lives can be beautiful, can it? I have my wife and kids here. And I find they're very beautiful. But no matter the beauty and the joy that we find here on earth, we'll always have a hunger for more. We'll never be satisfied with just this earth, right? There's nothing on this earth that actually can fully satisfy us. And if you think about it, no matter the beauty and joy we find here, we're still concerned with our soul. What's going to happen to us? Where do we go? What's... What happens next? And so we're always going to be looking for what actually is going to be out there. Where is our eternity in? And so no matter how much I love my family, I still have concerns about my soul. What happens when this life ends? And there isn't anything or anyone here on this earth that can actually answer that or help with that. For that, we have to look to the eternal one. We've got to turn to God. Now, this is the basis. So, the very simple message, live our lives, but look beyond them. Simple, right? Now for the second part. Rejoice and do good in our lives. Eat, drink, and enjoy the good of our labor is the gift of God. Now, it's before lunch for many of us. So it's very easy to hone in on the eat and drink part, right? But forget about that for now and go back to the beginning of that. The first part is rejoice and do good in our lives. Then we eat and drink and enjoy the friend of our labor. But notice how the first part is rejoice and not do good. You gotta rejoice before you do the good. And that's important. You know, if you're going out to help somebody and you're walking up to them and you're saying, hey, how you doing? How is it gonna be received if you're like, eh, take this? No matter what that good is, it's not gonna be well received, right? you got to have your head on straight before you actually go out to do good. And that's what he's telling you here. Know why you want to do good. Figure it out before you actually go out to do it. Otherwise, 
You just go into motions and it's not right. It's not just wanting to do good. It's actually looking forward to it. Rejoice and then do the good. So how do we look forward to doing good and serving others? That seems kind of hard work, right? It's not very exciting. So how do we do that? So we go back to the basis of living our lives. But we always look beyond them, right? Like Solomon says. If we remember that we're doing good to help others, but we're also helping ourselves, it actually makes it a lot more better. You got those folks that don't really want to, that are kind of hard to work with, kind of hard to deal with. They may not want your help. It makes it a whole lot easier to deal with that stubborn person. It makes it a whole lot easier to actually go out and do the work. When you actually remember why we're doing it. It's a kind of a, it's one of those paradoxes in life, right? You've got to help others to help yourself. And it's a weird thing about it, but it's true. If you remember that we're doing good, humbling ourselves to serve others in this life, to bank up treasure of being with God, and the next part of our lives, it takes a whole other look at what we're doing, right? We're trying to help them. We're trying to help ourselves by doing good. And if we, it's counterintuitive to do that, but that's exactly how life works. So God gave us these really simple instructions. We also made them interesting to learn, too. It's the reason he gave us these things like these paradoxes, where it's, you hit one thing, but it's actually doing something else. And that's actually a cool part about life. So this whole lesson here, we could do in like, see these few verses from Ecclesiastes, and there's a lot that you can do in Ecclesiastes. Love that book. But since we're trying to keep this in less than 30 minutes, let's keep on moving. So what do we have so far? Well, get to work. We've got to get moving, right? Appreciate this life, but always look beyond it. No matter what's happening here, always remember there's something more. And then rejoice first, then do good, and then enjoy what you did. It's kind of loop in there, but we'll get to that loop in the very end. But that, in a nutshell, is actually a great way to live the life and view life. But let's dive into a little bit more about that heaven in our heart part. So, for our own sake, we're concerned about our own soul. What's to come after we die? But that's us. That's here on this earth. If God gave us this game, why did he set the rules like that? Why did he say, I'm going to give you something to look forward to afterwards? Why did he give us that hunger in our heart? And for that, let's go. We're in the Old Testament right now. Let's jump to the New Testament. Let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians 2. So if we turn back to our instruction manual, he actually lays it out. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared us beforehand that we should walk in them. I notice that. We're talking about gifts again. How many of you think back just a few weeks of Christmas? How many of you gathered up the best gifts for people you did not like? <laughs> Nobody, right? We keep talking about these gifts of God, gifts of God. Who do we give gifts to? Who do we reserve those special gifts for? It's people that you love, right? And that's exactly what God's doing here. The reason he gave us that heaven in our hearts is like he gave us that compass to get back to him because he loves us. He could have done anything, but he gave us that Simple way to know back to how to get back to him. God's love is why he set the rules like he did. We're put into a challenging world. It's not easy. This game that he gave us is not a simple one. There's a lot that goes on here. But he gave us something simple to guide our way back. So he put that longing for heaven in our hearts to remind us that we really should be with God. Not wandering around this little rock that we call the earth. Now. Let's turn to the next part about rejoicing and doing good from the verses of Ecclesiastes. And let's go a little bit deeper on those two. 
Not just talk about what it means to do good. But let's look at another one of the paradoxes that God gave us that makes things interesting. For what God considers good. We already read the verses where things are summed up. And to love God with all that you are. Love your neighbor as yourself. But let's expand on that a little bit before we get to the paradox. So let's talk about what it means to do good. Just really quickly. And let's turn to a few quick verses. If you want to turn to them, otherwise I'll put them up on the screen. But let's turn to a book, James. Yes. And you'll see I quote a lot from Ecclesiastes and James. These are awesome books. James 1.27. And he does a nice job like Solomon does. He sums things up really succinctly. James 1.27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. It's easy, right? Visit people that need help. Keep yourself from doing wrong. Now, let's turn it back to the Old Testament. Not far from Matthew, not far from the Old Testament. Let's turn back to uh, Micah, Micah 6 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, notice about there's a theme here, right? All the good that God wants us to do, it's all rooted in love. And if you contrast that with things not to do, it becomes even clearer. So let's turn to Proverbs for a second and see about things not to do. Proverbs 6, 9, 6 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Now, Pretty clear when you even put the contrast right there. Now, think about this. If you're ever wondering, am I doing what's right? There's a simple rule of thumb. If you can put the words, because I love you, in front of it, it's a pretty good chance that's what's right. Now, think about this. Is there ever a time when you could put, because I love you, in front of these? Now, if it's, let's try it out. Because I love you, I thought way too much of myself. I lied, and I killed somebody innocent. It doesn't work too good, does it? It's, it's pretty much guaranteed. That's not going to happen. Doing good, knowing what is good, is really easy when viewed like this. Now let's get to that paradox we talked about. It's the first of the year. And a common tradition of the first year is making resolutions. How many of you made resolutions out there? Anybody? No? Okay. Well, <laughs> lots of people do. Maybe the, but it's a common thing to do. You all know what resolutions are, right? <laughs> all right. Most people make resolutions to basically better themselves. Losing weight, reading more, saving some money. All common kind of resolutions, they all center around self-improvement, right? Here's the weird paradox that God gave us. If you want to go on a journey of self-improvement, forget yourself. Now, how many, you ever heard the term peering into your own navel? Does anybody know what that means? Look inward. It does no good to peer into your own navel. Here's the secret. If you really want to find out who you are and improve yourself, seek God instead of yourself. That's really the key to it all. And it, it, it doesn't make sense. If you want to know who you are, you think, oh, okay, let me figure out what I like, what I don't like, what I can do, what I can't do. But the trick is God didn't make us like that. If you want to know who you are, look for God, and he'll tell you who you are. He's the one who made you. And here's the, here's the thing. Let's look back at the scripture we started off with. Let's go back to that for a second. Let's read that one more time. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house in the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Did something different happen to the first guy versus the second guy? There's not, right? 
And the winds came, the flood came up, the howling, basically they went through a storm, both of them. The only difference is where they stood, where their foundations were laid. And that's the only difference. This life, God's pretty much saying, it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to get you through it. Make your foundation in me and you'll do it. And if you think about that, it makes sense. It's a paradox to look for God to find yourself. But if he's who made us, he's really the one who can tell us more about us than we can actually find out about ourselves, right? You hear the saying, live your best life? Your best life is with God. And if you want to live your best life, find God. And then think about it. If you want to lose weight, packing boxes of fruit for the hungry is a pretty good way. Helping cut somebody's grass who can't is also pretty good. Carrying someone's food who's sick or walking to see somebody who needs it, also pretty good. Now, it's not to say you can't work out. Working out's actually still good. You need to prepare. But here's the thing. If you do it because of how you look versus what it'll let you do, which one do you think will stick with you longer? If you do it for what it'll let you do, it's much more meaningful. And I see some athletes shaking their heads. So they know. <laughs> they know that very well. When God tells us to seek him first, like in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. This is also not from the Sermon on the Mount. He's really telling you the secret of life. It's not just about the food and the shelter and the clothing. If you seek God, that's fulfillment. When you talk about being self-fulfilled or basically self-aware, know God first, and then you'll know yourself better than you ever did before. If we seek God first before ourselves, we end up being better off than we simply tried to find ourselves. So, the good news, he loves us. And those answers that we seek, he's more than willing to tell us. And if we follow him, even though the answers may be hard and the path may be hard, we still look for a better, don't we? So, keeping that challenge of 30 minutes or less, let's look at life's instruction set by vice a little bit. First step, see God. Then get to work. Or get to work seeking God. And then go back to work he wants you to do. And then always as you live this life, always remember to keep him in mind. Always keep that in eternity. Jesus and everything he was saying, he was always looking beyond. He was always talking about the eternal. Even though he had to live on this life, deal with people right here and the situations we deal with, he was always keeping a frame of mind of it's beyond this. There's more. So, if we really want to feel like we've done something at the end of the day, we get to work, we appreciate that journey, we don't want the fleeting beauty of this life because there is beauty and love in this life. There are things that God gave us to actually keep this life enjoyable. And the last step, and we talked about the rinse and repeat part, Rejoice, do good, enjoy that you did good, do it again. That's actually a really simple way to do life. The way you rejoice is that finding God, and then you realize, hey, this life is actually pretty good because it leads to somewhere it's meaningful. And no matter what happens in this life, you can still keep that goal in mind. And that way when you go to do good, you actually do it for the right reasons. It's not doing it just to go through the motions, it's not doing it because i got to get some community hours in. It's because you really want to. And then you actually enjoy it because it's actually helping you out as much as it is the other person. So there's a lot more that can be said. We can go on and on, but I think everybody probably wants to be done. So we'll wrap up. Yes, we're early. 30 minutes less. Hey, half, about 15 minutes less. But I'll leave it at this with a short, simple message. And if you've decided that you want to dedicate your life to God, join God's family through baptism now, tomorrow, the next day, any time is the right time to make that call. We happen to have water, and so it's very simple, but we can always find water. Most of the planet's covered in it. There's always a way to find it. So if you want to make that call today, or if you have anything you want to bring for the congregation, anything you need the prayers of the congregation for, please come as we stand and we sing a song for the invitation. Thank you.